So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, how are you guys doing today? Let me pull up my chat window. Um, before we continue with the lectures, uh, any any questions about assignment four, which is due tonight? I know some of you may have been struggling a little bit with some of the parts. Um, by the way, don't hesitate to to either shoot me an email or or uh, you know post some questions on the forum i'm happy to try to to help um also i think i comment this to some of you if you guys are struggling uh because you are busy with other things just let me know we can usually uh, there was two weeks for working on the assignment but if you guys need a little bit more of time maybe we can we can um extend a little bit the deadline um but I would really like to to know before we we reach the the, the deadline at midnight tonight. Okay, uh, Peter, for counting the total amount of infected people, should we use a for loop? Uh, good question, Peter. There are different ways uh, you can do. Some people, um, at least there are two main strategies. I would say some people can uh, has decide to report the total number of infected individuals in each. Um, single iteration. So in the same function that you compute the iteration, you just add how many individuals are infected in your infected uh, individual vector. And then that's one way. Another way is to, um, you can use the table function, absolutely. Another way will be to um, return a vector uh, or fill a vector with every single iteration and the number of, of um, infected individuals where each element in the vector is, is the, that total amount. I don't have any particular preference. I think the way I implemented in, in my solution was to, to actually create a vector that is being updated with the total number of infected individuals per iteration. And then at the end, I can, I can either you know, print that to the screen or if I want to plot a, a, a graph, I could do that. So I have full control of the data, uh, of the summarized data per iteration. But um, if you decide to just print that number per iteration, that would be fine. If you decide to use the table function, that would be fine. Okay, so this is, is a little bit up to, to you. Um, as you will see in this assignment, there are a lot of, of um, free elements in how you design the solution, how you implement the solution, and that's okay. Um, I think I mentioned this, I don't remember this in the lectures or in the, one of the office hours. Uh, some people can even solve, I think it's part 1D, which is probably one of the most uh, complicated parts in the assignment, either using a couple of for loops and if statements, uh, other people decided to use, or I have seen solutions where they is all vectorized. Um, by the way, one, one thing I, I, I didn't mention this, not, it's not mandatory neither. One nice way to do this is, is to use apply functions. Um, so. There are, as I said, there are a couple of different ways in which one uh, can proceed to, to tackle this problem, okay? Uh, but as I told you to some of you, don't, don't hesitate to, to, as I say, uh, reach out if you guys need help or are struggling with some of the parts, okay? Does I answer your question, Peter? To my slides. Perfect. Okay. So uh, if you guys don't have any other questions, let's go back to the lecture. Okay. So that you guys can see my slides. If not, please let me know. Um, so I think we we finished here um, talking about some of the functions that we can use for uh, for plotting. Any any questions about this material? Okay. By the way, the, the assignment, the next assignment is posted or will be posted. It's, it's already on the web, but uh, we're going to talk about this at the end of this lecture. And, and it's going to be about plotting. And I hope that you guys can enjoy this. It's usually a fun 
assignment, at least for me, to Gray because I, I, I get the chance to see some, some nice visualizations done by, by some of you guys. So one more thing before getting into the professional plotting is we're going to talk about uh, high dimensional plots, two dimensional and three dimensional plots, and they come in different different ways on different flavors, if you, if you wish. Um, so let's start with contour plots. So contour plots are a way to basically reduce high dimensional data, usually three dimensional data into a two dimensional representation. So think about a surface or any kind of, of volume that it can be basically cut, intersected with planes. And then these intersections can be basically uh, collapse or, or draw into a plane, a flat plane. And so that's the main idea. So in this case, we are going to take a particular analytical expression is nothing else than a, a, a Gaussian, a two-dimensional or three-dimensional Gaussian, depending on who you, you want to represent. So for doing that, we are going to define how many levels of intersections we want in, your, in our planes. And then we are going to define two set of coordinates, x and y, going from minus four pi up to four pi, and then with as many points as 27 in this case, but it could be something arbitrary. Then we are going to take the quantity x and power to, to the two, and we're going to take this as a matrix representation. And so we're going to multiply x by x and take uh, the matrix to have n rows. Now, the reason why I'm going to use this matrix representation is because we want a system of coordinates. So for each point x, I want a point y. So that's why you, you have this sort of Cartesian uh, coordinate system laid down into a matrix uh, representation where each of the elements, each element in the matrix corresponds to a, a pair of points X and Y. And the same you do for Y, but because the, the domain here is exactly the same in X and Y, you just take the transpose of X and that's how you get your, your Y coordinates. And then the function that we're going to see for creating this contour representation is called fill.contour. And then we need the coordinates x and y that go from minus four pi up to four pi in x and y. And then the expression of the function that we want to, to basically slice, cut with these planes, uh, with set equal constant planes, if you wish. In this case, it's nothing else, as I told you, is the, the uh, two dimensional Gaussian exponential of minus x squared plus y squared over a certain width. Uh, and that's basically it. So in this case, where you see this, this color, these colors on the on the on the plot are representations of the different values. And if you remember, the exponential goes from zero to one, where this is exponential centered at the zero zero point. So the highest value close to one is at the center of the domain. And then as far as you you move away from the center, from the origin of coordinates, then it, it quickly goes down to zero. And, and, and that's basically how you do it. Now, uh, there are some, some things you can control, the, the coordinates in the X and Y axis. We saw this, this command last class, title of X lab and Y lab, and then you can, you can start to, to populate your plot with more information. The interesting thing is uh, automatically when you do the field contour, it also shows a color map on the right, giving you a key between, or a mapping between the colors and the actual value that these colors represent, okay? Um, so that's one way of representing high dimensional data uh, by projections and intersections into a two dimensional plane. But we can also represent three dimensional plots. Now, the, the thing that you need to bear in mind is that by default, R doesn't have the capability of doing three dimensional plots. So we will need uh, some additional libraries. Um, the other interesting fact is if you remember me commenting something about ccplot at the beginning of this visualization uh, lectures is ccplot doesn't uh, do uh, neither three-dimensional plot. So that's one of the things that there are not too many libraries, but there are some good and interesting libraries that you can explore if you want to do 3D representations. The one I'm going to show you, oh, sorry, I, I take something back. There is a basic capability in R for doing a mesh representation of surfaces. And this is achieved with the pairs for per perspective uh, function. So the perspective function is exactly the same function as we were seeing before the um, two dimensional Gaussian. So we're going to take the coordinates X and Y and the same analytical expression. And then you, you get this kind of mesh uh, representation of the, of the function. You can even rotate that 
uh, with the azimuth and angle and the polar angle of the of the perspective you can even put a title on your set um, access and you can even do some grading uh, or shading in the in the visualization so that's not so bad but it's quite limited that's what i mean with uh, there are not too many three-dimensional capabilities in r by default okay so it's a similar representation to the example that we saw before, but this uh, or same information, but represented in a slightly different manner. Okay. But uh, the function, the library, sorry, I want to mention that many people use for uh, three-dimensional plot, in particular, because these functions are good when you have an analytical form, as you can see, I have X and Y coordinates, and then I have a formula that I can evaluate and either do my, my contours or I can do my, my mesh or wireframe representation of that shape. But if you are dealing with data and you, for instance, are looking at scatter plots in 3D of the data, then uh, there is a library called scatterplot 3 d uh, which has a lot of functionalities. It's, it's, a, it's a very good one. And it's quite simple to use. But again, it's one of not of the default packages that comes to with R, so you will need to, to install it, okay? So you will need to do install.package scatterplot 3 d uh, for using the package, you do library to the plot 2D and, and that's it. So I have a couple of examples taken actually from the package website. And so we're going to start a new graphic device. We saw this command device device.new. And then I'm going to define again a couple of coordinates. Uh, in this case, set, my parameter set goes from minus 10 to 10 and a step of 0.01. It's kind of a dummy variable that control the, the, the drawing of whatever I want to draw. And then X and Y are given by the cosine and sine functions. And um, basically what you will get is you evaluate uh, cosine and sine of set, and then you represent X and Y and set as, as the independent parameter. It's nothing else than a helix, helix representation. And that's exactly what you achieve by using the scatter plot uh, 3D command or function for X, Y, and Z. And then there are some options that you can control. For instance, if you do highlight 3D equal true, what you get is different colors associated to the different heights of the points in the set axis. Uh, you can also color differently your axis. So the, the axis in this case, the box, um, where the coordinate, uh, coordinates are, are drawn is, 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 is colored in blue. Uh, you can put your uh, lines in the grid in a different color, light blue, for instance. You can put a main title in the plot. You can select the size of your points with PCH. Uh, and you can do a lot of customization with different options in, in a scatter plot 3D. Okay, so it's just a simple example. This is another example. Um, this is a nice example because it combines also some sort of linear modeling as we saw in a couple of lectures ago. So again, uh, in this case, I'm going to use the trees data frame that we saw some time ago. And what I'm going to do in this case, I'm going to plot uh, the points coming from the trees data frame. Uh, I'm going to have different heights associated with different colors. Type H, what does it, it, draw, it draws a line from the horizontal plane to the point, the data point. In this case, we are representing volume versus girls and height. So the volume is in the set coordinate. And what we're going to do is, we're, in addition to that, we are going to, <coughs> excuse me, we are going to uh, try to create a model. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run my linear model here, very similar to what we did in the example uh, some weeks ago, but also I'm going to have two uh, independent variables or two response variables, sorry, two explanatory variables, girls and height meaning that volume will be or consider a function of first and high coming from the three data frame. And what you see now is that I can with the, if I assign my plot of the scatter points to a variable, then I can use S3D dollar sign plane 3D is, this is called a method or a function associated to the plot. And I can put my linear model there. And this kind of dash lines represents the plane that uh, represents the linear model that we just created. So it's very useful in particular when you do multivariate analysis and, and you have a couple of main components or main ingredients, main variables, as you say, um, driving that model to do some sort of visualization. So in that regards, it's, it's, um, it's interesting to have that, okay? By the way, the, you also can add points here. Uh, what I'm doing here with the point is just, is just 
adding uh, some arbitrary points, this, this blue line in particular, just to show that you can also add some points to the plot. But this, these blue points are not part of the data set. It's just, just to show a little bit of the capabilities of the package. Okay. Any questions about this? Again, there are a lot of a lot of examples, in particular in the website associated with a cutter plot 3D. Um, so again, if you had to deal with data that needs to be represented in a three-dimensional manner, probably it's a nice package to take a look at that. If you need to have more um, complex kind of uh, data represented in high dimensional, there are other packages. Um, RCL is a really good one, although it's a little bit demanding in terms of the hardware. You need to have OpenGL or some sort of support for processing graphics, um, but this is the what you need to do that, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about how to save your figures because we haven't talked about that. Uh, so there are different ways in which you can store, you can save the plots that you generated. And that's probably something that you want. Similarly to, uh, you know, having the need of saving the data after we do some processing, as we discussed before, we also want to save the figures that we, we generated so that we can put in our thesis, put in our papers, uh, share with collaborators, whatever, right? So there are a couple of functions. There are different functions that allow you to, to do that. Uh, most of them, what they do is they take the figure that you have in your active graphic window and it dump into a particular format. Um, so the BMP function basically allows you to select a file name and save the, um, the figure as bitmaps. Shipex does something similar, PNG something similar, TIFF. So all these are different file formats or, or file, uh, figure file formats. Um, but important, important thing to remember is I will strongly recommend, and, and this is going to be part of the professional plotting requirements, that you save your figures in what is called a vectorized file format. What is a vectorized file format? Well, PDF and EPS, encapsulated postscript um, PDF for portable data formats, are, are vectorized formats, meaning that if you want to actually represent a figure, there are two main ways to do that. One is, okay, you, you have a figure, take a picture, take a plot, you divide this in a tiny grid, and then each box in the intersection of this grid in the X and Y coordinates represents what we call a pixel. And this is also called uh, bit maps. Basically each, each element is, is a bit of information in that map of the, of the figure. And then you, you select the color and with the composition of all that, you can reproduce your figure. The problem with those formats, BMP, JPEG, and PNG, and, and TIFF and GIF, are that as soon as you change the size, you stretch or, com or compress the figure, the resolution will change and you get, vector you get pixelized images. And those are not good. You can see those when you place in a document and you start to stretch it, they start to look bad. They lost the, the resolution that they were saved initially. So instead, what we prefer to use and what most of the journals uh, recommend is to use vectorized file formats um, in which instead of saving the actual pixel, what you save is a vector. Actual vector represents the, the position and the color code of that position in the, in the figure. And in that way, when you stretch, when you change the dimensions of that figure, the vectors can adapt because now they are a mathematical object that it can be stretched, rotated, tweak it with however you want, and the resolution is preserved. So it, it, it ends up in, in, in you having better quality figures that can be manipulated more easily. So bottom line is in the professional quality plots, we're going to be using these vectorized file formats, okay? So not BMP, not PNG, nothing like that, which in some cases are good for, uh, you know, if you want to include those in, in a web page or something like that, but not for a, for a journal, not for a publication quality purpose. Um, there are other auxiliary functions similar to the device new functions. These are device copy or device copy to PDF or device print. This allow you to do also some of um, saving what is being displayed in a particular uh, window into a, into a file. And it was pretty much the same as, as the previous functions. The previous function has to be invoked before you start plotting. 
and then you you do the bytes off at the end to close the file to end the the saving of the data into the file. We're going to see examples of this. Okay, but this is an alternative way to do that. Um, any questions so far? All right. So we're going to see some of the elements in professional plotting. Then we're going to see some of the examples, okay? So what things are mandatory in professional uh, looking plots? Uh, well, uh, labels in the axis, in the lines, in the data. The idea here is that if I look at a, a figure from your paper, I should be able to understand, even if I don't really know the, the content of the paper, but just I should be able to understand what the figure is trying to communicate. And for knowing that, I need to know what is being plot. Uh, of course, the, the uh, underlying concepts I may not get if I don't know anything about the field, but I should be able to understand what the figure represents. Many people nowadays go read papers, read the astral, read the figures and the results. And if they do that, you, you will still want them to, to get an idea of what your results, what your research is about. Units, again, this is something that uh, is, is a mass, you must have all units unless there is a, a unit less or, 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 or the quantity you are representing doesn't have units, but in most of the cases, you, you will have units. Uh, Leshes when appropriate, again, if I'm plotting a, a linear model on top of my data, it would be good to say, okay, this is the model uh, obtained by uh, linear regression or, or minimization of square errors or whatever technique you use, right? Uh, the font size, this is particular tricky. Usually many of the plotting tools that we're going to see, they had a default size for the fonts, which end up being quite small when you, when you include your figure in your articles, so in your paper. So usually it's good to increase or control, at least have control on, on the size of the fonts. Uh, okay, this is an in interesting thing that usually uh, people get confused. When you are talking about Publi uh, plots in publications, in papers or, or thesis, you don't need to put a title. The description of what the plot is, uh, is done or, or the interpretation of the results goes in the, in the caption, in the, in, the, uh, in the note of the figure, right? So th the reason why we don't want to put titles in the plots is, well, it looks, that, you will see, you, you almost never see that in, in manuscripts. Um, it takes real estate space from your plot and usually you try to maximize uh, the amount of data and, and methods that you want to convene in the plot. So usually you don't.
Hello, can you guys hear me? I think my yes. my okay, thank you. Sorry, I think my my um Zoom crash. So let me let me restart this again. Here we go. So I'm not exactly sure um, what was the last thing that you guys uh, hear from me. Um, I was talking about the um, the items that we expect to get in professional uh, looking plots. Um, me also. Sorry, I want to start the recording again, uh, otherwise we won't be able to have it. Uh, Um, so I think I was talking, at least when I noticed that uh, the connection crashed, I was talking about um, making the data fill the plot, um, but please do let me know if that, um, if I missed something or something was missed in, in, uh, on that. Um, but maybe better than, than just me talking, I will show you um, what I meant with that, okay? So, and a couple more of things, and these are things that, again, we are going to see in the examples, is um, we are going to control the image size and resolution. Uh, and in many cases, this is something that is requested by, by the journals as well. So sometimes you, you will need to check, okay, what are the criteria, what are the, the, um, the uh, resolutions required by the journals. I mentioned this, try to not use, I would strongly recommend about using bitmaps or, or any kind of uh, file format that is not a vectorized one. Okay, so try to, to, to avoid doing that. Um, my suggestion, recommendation, and, and the format that most of the, of the journals uh, take nowadays are EPS, which stands for encapsulated postscript or PDF or even postscript. Uh, but PDF is, uh, is one that everyone is more or less familiar nowadays. We are going to try to reduce the amount of white space. You will notice by default R in particular puts a lot of white space around in the plots. So we're going to try to control, to shrink that space as much as possible. And the final thing that's something we, we are going to be doing in the assignment is to create, um, to create scripts in order to perform all these gymnastics, all these procedures of saying, okay, this is my script that will generate my, my paper for the, sorry, my figure for the paper. And then if the, show, if the journal or the referee asks for changes or, you know, something has to change that is new data or data has to be adjusted, then you can easily go and tweak the script instead of, you know, going in a, in a tool and modifying the plot uh, with, a, with a GUI or something like that. That's the aim of this, of this part. So this is the example of the plot I was just talking a few minutes ago about um, not a, such a good idea in terms of uh, combination of colors. And not only that, uh, the combination of colors is, is not the best. Uh, you can actually not see much. Of course, this is a, a, a obvious case that no one will put a, a plot like this in a paper or your thesis, right? But this is, this is an example of, of many bad things happening, right? The, 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 the background of the image is, is not helping reading the numbers, although there are numbers in the access. We don't know which this number represents because there are no titles. Uh, the colors, as I say, they, it kind of hurt your eyes when you look at the plot. Uh, so many of the things that I was uh, mentioning before I illustrated in a, in a very, very string case here, but I hope that you guys can get the idea of why not uh, doing those kind of things. So let's take a first uh, uh, look at one example. So this is a script. It's not even in a function, but this is a script. So it has the main elements, the main ingredients that you will need to put in your functions for the assignment. So this is a script that generates um, a, a, a professional looking plot that we're going to see. It's a, simple, it's a simple script and simple data and a simple plot as well. But as I say, it has the main, the main ideas. So this is data from one of my colleagues assigned it. Um, he was working in his thesis at that time and it's experimental data taken from uh, different measurements. So he has 
five data points for two variables, uh, observation one and observation two is, is for fluid dynamics actually. And then the other thing that my colleague was doing at that time was doing a linear fit between these, these two observations. So basically this is the data we're going to be working with that we're going to observe how it, it looks like and, and the linear fit, the model for this data. So the first thing that we're going to do, as I say, we are already selecting the file format, in this case, a, a PDF file format, is to identify the, uh, to specify the name of the file, Rosby instability.pdf. These are the sizes for the figure. This is a standard size for a two column manuscript, for instance, in inches, given in inches, but you can play with that. Now, when you play with that, you will need to also adjust the margins accordingly. And sometimes this is a little bit of uh, trial and error. So that's why it's also a good idea to put this into a function or a script, and then you can go and modify some of the parameters. Even some of these parameters can be arguments for the functions, if you wish. Um, but then by using this size, this is a good combination of margin selections. So this selects the margins in inches, for that particular figure, and you will see at the end the final product that is, is not bad. Now, what we are going to do is a simple plot, but we're going to control every single element, element in the plot. So we're going to start by plotting observation two as the X variable, observation one as the Y variable. We are going to turn off all what is annotation and axis, and then we're going to draw those by hand, or not by hand, but basically controlling exactly what we want. So annotations false, access false, basically give you just the points on the plot. In addition to that, we're going to control the range of values between X and Y. So from 40 to 330, and that is basically covering almost the same range as the points. Similarly for Y from 100 to 1100. And then we control the size and the type of, of, of symbol that we're going to, represent, to use to represent the data. Now we are going to add the line, the model, the linear model. So a line of my feet in this case, and line type two is just the type of line that we're going to use a dash line in this case. Box, remember this command basically will draw a, a, a box around the plot. And that is to mimic um, the, uh, the drawing of the axis. And on top of that, we are going to put the labels and, and the names and the values of the axis. So axis is a function that allows to control exactly that. Psi one means the X axis in, in the horizontal bottom direction. We are not placing levels yet, just drawing the axis. And then we are going to say, okay, we are going to put certain levels uh, with a certain uh, distance from, from the line. So minus 0.3 moves a little bit that. In addition to that, we are going to put, to put a title. And in this case, we are using something called a LaTeX rendering. So I don't know if you guys are uh, familiar with that, but LaTeX is, is a technique or a language to write high quality manuscript may, used by many people. And when you use this expression function, basically you can write things like omega, which is going to be translated as a Greek letter omega, or bracket two is going to look as a sub index to the Greek letter omega. So that's why we are using this expression function. So the X level will be omega sub two, and the units is going to be uh, revolutions per minute. So it's, it's, a, it's an angular velocity for these quantities. Um, axis psi equal two is the Y axis on the left. And the same idea, we're going to draw the axis and then we're going to place, uh, in this case it's omega one, is the other angular velocity. And then we're going to add two walls that are divided by the, by the feet one is a stable regime, a stable region in the plot, and then an unstable regime or stable region. These are the coordinates, which are based on the coordinates of the data. And then CX2 is the size of the characters. And then at the end, you see this device, uh, device of function, which basically what it's doing is just closing the file, closing the PDF file. Okay. And if you run this script, this is the plot that you will obtain. So the, the thin line around is the actual figure, the limits of the figure. And then you can see it's, it's, it's a quite good quality figure in the sense that all the data is basically filling most of the, of the uh, area for the plot. You get the stable region on top of the, of the feed, the unstable region below the feed. You get your axis, uh, X and Y, the quantities. So it, it's a good looking plot for, for a paper. 
Okay, the things that you should notice is by controlling the margins and the controlling the size, all the white spaces that are placed by default that gives a kind of a square look to the plot are gone. Okay, just for comparison, let me show you. Let me show you. So these are some of the comments I just made. The margins are tight, minimal white space, the data fills most of the plot, um, all those things. But let me just show you, let me just show you how the plot will look like if I don't control anything of that. So this is a similar script to the one I just showed you, but I'm not controlling the size of the figure, neither I'm controlling the margins of the figure. And if I do that, the, the figure on the right with this kind of a square looking shape is the one that you will obtain in comparison to the figure on the left that is the one that we obtain by controlling all the margins, by controlling the size of the image. And as you can see, the, 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 obviously both plots are, are legible, but the difference in, in aesthetics and appearance are, are, are quite remarkable. And definitely I will recommend a plot like the one on the left for a for a quality uh, publication than the one on the right. Okay, so that is kind of the target here. That is what we're going to be targeting in particular with assignment five to create a scripts, create functions that their goal is to produce this kind of high quality or professional quality plots for your manuscripts and your thesis. Okay, so that you can rerun your function if you need to update the data or something and the function just will basically uh, generate the plot for you. Any questions about this example and, uh, and the criteria that we are looking for in, in professional equality plots? If not, I have another example. <clears throat> it's more of a high dimensional data representation of, of, of in a figure. Uh, it's going back to the contour plots that we saw at the beginning. And as you can see, the field contour function gives you access to a very quick way to plot contour levels in a, in a three-dimensional representation of data. But this kind of what you get out of the box, right? It's not customized in any means. So this script, the second script, what it has in mind is customization of, of a little bit of a contour representation of, of data. So we're going to use the library fields because that give us access to some uh, functionalities and some, some data, in particular, the volcano data. The third thing is we're going to get from the volcano data is a pre predefined data set for us, uh, the dimensions in X and Y. So it's, it's a matrix representation. So that's why dimensions will give you two numbers. We're going to take in the X direction, the second entry, in the Y direction, the first entry. We are going to use 25, uh, levels for slicing the data. So this is a topographical representation of data that is going to be a slice with 25 uh, planes, if you wish, or 25 contour levels. And of course, first thing that we are going to do is start a word PDF file. So it's a PDF. Uh, it's going to be called volcano.pdf. It's, as you notice, it's the same, same size as before. It's, again, this is a custom size for two column publications, but you can change that if your data requires more space or you prefer to have a larger uh, figure. And then we're going to customize the access again. And again, this, this you may need to play a little bit depending on your data, but you can start with these values and, and see how you, you adjust that. Uh, the other thing that we are going to define, this is usually nice when you have color maps, is to define a palette. And in this case, we are going to take a palette that is go from orange to blue. Again, this is up to you at the end what colors you use, what colors. There are some, some criteria for, for best looking colors in, in some cases. And the palette will have as many levels as uh, slicing levels in this case. So in this case, we will have 25 um, shades, if you wish, between orange and blue. Now, this is something I, I, I haven't shown you before, but we can use the plot dot, uh, plot dot new function. And this basically uh, creates a, a template or, or, or a canvas, an empty canvas for a start filling uh, with graphic objects or graphic elements. And uh, in particular, where you're going to use the member function dot fill contour, which is a function associated to this plot dot new function, which is at the end, the same function as we saw before, fill dot contour. And of course, the quantities we're going to use is yx. I just reverted, transpose uh, the image as you wish, 
it could be x y but it will you will see it will look better if you do the y direction horizontally instead of vertically and then volcano is the, is the actual date now the levels how many how many uh iso contours iso levels or slices i want is given by uh, uh, n levels so in this case sorry okay, it should be say n levels here it's a typo should be 25 the color is going to be given by the color palette that we just defined above and then on top of that, we are going to define X levels and Y levels to be a sequence between one and an X every 10 and similar for Y. And set level, it goes between zero and one with 11 elements only. Now, one other thing that is going to be different because I'm going to do this for a couple of, of axes. I, I could have done that in the previous um, example, but it was just good to see how, what elements we were controlling first is we're going to define an auxiliary function called dx. Uh, so dAx controls the aesthetics of the, of the axis. So in this case, it's a function that receives one, two, three, four, five, six uh, arguments. And the first argument is the side, which side of the, of the axis are, are we controlling? Then the type of line, uh, then the label uh, that we want, a second type of line, and then and then um, from one to two is basically the the range of values that we want to display on that particular axis. So in this case, we are going to call twice the axis function, similarly to what we did in the previous plot. First, to draw the axis without no labels, and then just putting the tick marks at the particular lab intervals that we want. The second one with length width equal zero is without drawing the line, but then fixing the labels at the particular interval and with a particular value for the labels. And so that's the definition of the function, this auxiliary function. The other thing we're going to do now is just call that function. So we are calling the function for axis one. The displacement of the, of the tick's mass is minus 0.56 in relative coordinates. The x label are given by the sequence of this value that we define here. Um, and then the coefficient for, for uh, specifying which values we want to represent in the axis. The label uh, is just meters because it's, it's just coordinates in the topographical representation of the volcano. And, and that's basically it. And the same thing we do uh, for the y axis. So these two are basically in charge. These two functions and title functions are in charge of representing what is going to look in the, in the x and y axis. There is one more element in this plot that we want to control in this case, which is the color bar representation. If you remember the two-dimensional Gaussian example, there is uh, also the color bar that is represented on the side. So in this particular case, we can control that with color bar dot plot. We can place, so these are coordinates where we want to place. So it's a 1.07. This again is in relative coordinates. The end of the plot is a one. So uh, seven percent. After that, we place on the x alert, uh, in the x direction the color bar, and then not offset on the vertical direction. The number of levels is again. This should be n levels. I apologize for that. We are saying that we want the plot, the color bar, to be vertical by setting horizontal equal false. We are then saying what is the width and the strip length for that, and then the colors is given by the color of the palette and um, adjustment in Y, we don't want any adjustment. You can have a displacement if you wish. The other thing is by using this D.AX function, we are going to control the right side of the axis. And now this corresponds to the axis or the levels on the color bar. You will see that in a second. And this is just the range of values. And then we are placing a test with saying this color represents the height and it's on the side four. SRT 90 is because we are going to rotate 90 degrees this text and it will look like it's written uh, vertically instead of horizontal. Okay. And at the end, as before, we close the PDF file. Okay. And, and this is how the plot looks like. It's, it's, it's a really nice plot, if you ask me. Uh, some things to, to notice is again, we, we tie the margins very closely so that we reduce the amount of white space around the plot. If you notice, I didn't use the box command in this figure. So there is no box uh, drawn around the plot itself. You shall see the, um, the uh, contour representation or the ISO surface levels. Um, the color goes from orange to blue, as we define in our, in our palette. 
uh, the access are well controlled. The color bar doesn't have a box neither, but it has the right side margin that we just add with dx and psi equal four. And the height, as I told you, is rotated 90 degrees just to follow the orientation of the, of the values plot on the side of the, of the lab. Okay. So any questions about these two examples? No. Okay. Uh, again, some few notes about these representations. Margins are tight. The color bar is new to Y and is close to the figure. The colors are easy to read. The color bar is level, both in magnitude the units. Um, yeah, so you use so most of these elements. So notice again, there are no title here again, right? No title in this in this plot. Uh, there is no real need for that. Okay. So let me see. So the next topic, uh, let me see. Uh, maybe maybe we can stop here and go to the assignment. I apologize again for the interruption with the connection. It never happened to me since, since the beginning of the pandemic, I have been teaching in this format and I don't think ever happened to me. And I'm not sure what happened. I'm not sure if it was my, my internet connection or just uh, Zoom giving up on me. I have been using Zoom <laughs> a lot today. Maybe, maybe Zoom need a break. <laughs> I didn't give, uh, didn't give Zoom a break before. Um, in any case, um, let me stop this. Um, let me bring Mark um, course website. All right, so this is about assignment five, professional plotting. And the idea here, um, as I say, I usually have a lot of fun with, with this assignment because I get the chance to see uh, really, really nice products coming from sometimes your own research or your own area of interest. Um, but the idea here is that if possible, this is not mandatory by any means, but if possible, and, and you know, you want to, to take advantage of this, try to use your own data. And it doesn't need to be, you know, unpublished data or anything. It can be even data or plots that you have already published in, or you have prepared for your manuscripts or your thesis. Well, the idea here is that you are going to write a couple of functions that will reproduce or will generate that plot uh, or a plot that you would like to generate uh, by following uh, the examples that we saw in class or, or, or whatever means you need by, by following this professional looking um, strategies as you wish. So there will be, uh, or there has to be two uh, functions. Um, and then there will be a main wrapper function. So the, the plotting functions will be in a utility files and, and then there will be a generate plots dot our main driver script that will have a generate plots function that will take will take one argument. Um, so if the argument is 2D, the, the, the script will call the function that generates a two-dimensional plot. If the argument is 3D, the function will call uh, the script will call a function that generates a three-dimensional plot. Now let me clarify this because it's a little bit vague, and this depends a lot on the type of data that you want to work with or or that you had available. What I mean with two-dimensional plots is a little bit the example that we saw, the first example that we saw, just dots and, uh, and a model, maybe. Now again, don't get too restricted on that. The idea there is that you have something that can be represented by two dimensions, but if you don't have that, or you have more complicated data or less complicated data, try to figure out something. The idea though is that both representations should have at least uh, two graphical objects. So you can not only plot your data, you need to plot your data and a model or two data sets, something like that, okay? The three dimensional representation can be a different things. 
I actually, what I have done in my previous courses, let me see if you can open this, is I created a visualization gallery where I basically select the, the visualizations I like the most for different reasons. In some cases, it can be because they, they follow very nice professional looking um, uh, schemes or strategies. You know, it's because the, the visualization is innovative or has something interesting to, to, to show. So you can see some examples here. Uh, of different so different courses. I haven't had the chance yet to include visualization from this course, but maybe you guys can, can help me <laughs> contributing to that. But you can see here some examples, right? So this is this is a kind of a two-dimensional plot that follows the, the good uh, or best practices uh, advices where there are data points. And this fit obviously is not linear, it's exponential fit, but the idea is there. There are two elements, the marshes are controlled, uh, those kind of things. Uh, other examples, this is a, a kind of contour representation. Uh, again, most of the things or elements are there. There are some elements of, of designs or personal preference, but the main ingredients, the main uh, elements are there. And, and you can go and see. So for instance, we talk about um, uh, dendrograms and heat maps, and, and that's another thing that you can decide to do. So there is some freedom here, basically. That's why I'm saying that you can pick what kind of representation you would like to, to, to try and try to make it fit within the concepts that we just discussed. So it has to be a PDF file generated. It has to be generated by a function. Um, the function actually that the generates the plot can also set an argument describing the data. Okay, so if you want to read the data from a file or a website or whatever, uh, so think a little bit about what you would like to do, what kind of a script you would like to have for your own purposes and try to use this as an opportunity to explore that. Um, other than that, there is no much uh, things um, to be said. The other thing is I add an optional part <clears throat> to this uh, assignment and it's optional because we haven't covered it yet, but this is what we are going to cover in the next lecture, which is related to interactive visualization of data. So again, with these two functions, you will reach the maximum of the, of the assignment 10, but you can get basically 25% extra if you decide to try the interactive part. Most of the people try because it's fun and like to, to do it either way, um, but that is going to come uh, on next class, okay? Uh, this is an example of how the script should work. So you will source your main driver script, and then I'm going to call your generate plots with either 2D or 3D. You should say, what is it doing? And if you decide to do the optional part with interactive, and it will, we will see next class what, what will uh, be the result of that. But if I call uh, the script with anything else that is not that, then the script should protest. So it should have a level of defensive programming in the sense that it should control what type of arguments is accepted. Okay. Um, the thing I'm going to ask you to submit is the two R files. The data sets that you decide to use, so I should be able to reproduce your, your figures. And then just as a, as a control mechanism, just to, if for whatever reason, um, I run into trouble generating your figures, the original figures or the figures that you generated, just to be sure that you uh, basically were able to achieve this in your own. Um, you, I get this question, you are, you are free to use any libraries that you want. If people is in the ccplot camp, and are you keen to use ccplot and ccplot, as I think I mentioned this on the first lecture about visualization, take control of many things like the margins and, and things like that. You are welcome to do so, but if you need to deal with other things, it, it's going to probably give you a little bit of, of no headaches, but uh, you will need to uh, dig a little bit more in, in ccplot. By the way, if you are going to use ccplot, PDF and device close won't work, ccplot has its own function save for saving figures okay and same same criteria and same uh, conditions supply you should decide to use ccplot okay so bear that in mind so minimization of white spaces saving a pdf formats controlling the resolution and size of the figure etc etc all right um any questions about either what we discussed today in the lecture um, about assignment number four, which is due tonight, or assignment number five, which we just discussed.
Okay. Uh, all right. So if there are no questions, then we probably can stop here. Um, we have two more lectures to go. My goal is for lecture number 11, finish the visualization part. And then lecture number 12, as I say, I think right now I'm, I'm targeting high performance R. But as I told you several times, if anyone has a different, um, a different uh, topics or something that you would like to see cover for the last lecture, please do let me know. We can, I can try to, to uh, accommodate that, okay? And as I mentioned at the beginning, if you guys are having trouble with the assignments, just shoot me an email, post something on the forum, um, all right? And if not, I think that's all what I have for you guys today. No problem, Shadow.